Okay, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the third of our series of COVID conversations. Sorry, my chair is a bit wobbly. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Joe to introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody, first of all, very much for coming. And um, so um, I would like to direct you for, uh, towards our website to um, look at um, a blog that is there for our colleague, sorry, Hakim, who has um, very sadly passed away suddenly. And also then for our annual conference, um, Making Space, um, which is hosted by the University of Limerick and the registration is open this evening for that. The previous talk on futures is also now up on the website and um, information about Deborah Padfield's new book, which you can download for free. And there's information about the book launch and workshops if you wish to attend those. Uh, we would like to suggest that you keep an eye out for future events because we intend uh, to plan some more of these. Um, they've been very well attended and highly successful. And if you would like to become a member or rejoin, all of that is very much streamlined through the website too. So I thought rather than remembering anything, if you just remember to look at the website for anything you need. And now after welcoming you, it is my absolute pleasure to hand over to Joe and Zoe, who are our co-hosts for this evening, to do the welcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and a very warm welcome to those of you who are rejoining us um, for our uh, next conversation in the series this evening. Um, uh, and also to those of you who are joining us for the first time tonight. I think this is probably, we've grown in size every single time and this, is, uh, this has been our, um, uh, our sort of biggest booking, if you like, um, for this evening. So welcome to everybody. We're very pleased to have you all here with us. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, as as always, we'll ask you to keep your mics off and Zoe and I will be keeping an eye on the mics just to make sure they're off so that we don't have uh, any feedback noise that interrupts our speakers. We'd ask you please to put your questions in chat um, and uh, Zoe uh, will curate those questions um, and bring them in um, uh, as, as, and, as and when. We will finish promptly at, uh, at 9 p.m. this evening out of courtesy uh, to our speakers, not keep them too long. Um, so same as always really in terms of the, the housekeeping. So tonight we'll continue with the theme community, on community. And as with our previous themes, loss and futures, tonight again, we're bringing together clinical and humanities scholarly voices. We're opening up a transdisciplinary medical humanities space to talk and reflect across disciplinary boundaries. Tonight, we will explore the ways that the idea of community, as well as various communities themselves, have been challenged and yet perhaps also reinvigorated in the face of the crises we are currently living through. In their recent call to arms, the Care Manifesto, the British group, the Care Collective Right, and I'm gonna quote from the book itself here, over the past few decades, many of us have experienced living in an accelerating social system of organized loneliness. We have been encouraged to feel and act like hyper individualized competitive subjects who primarily look out for ourselves. We need localized environments in which we can flourish, in which we can support each other and generate networks of belonging. We need conditions that enable us to act collaboratively to create communities that both support our abilities and nurture our interdependencies. This week, newspapers around the globe reported Boris Johnson's declaration, allegedly made privately to a group of Tory MPs, that the success of the COVID-19 vaccination program in the UK was down to greed and capitalism. So community, collectivity, altruism, care, love would seem to be irrelevant then to Johnson. In substantial or irrelevant contexts for the astounding delivery of mass vaccination, of the mass vaccination programme in the UK, which has been delivered by healthcare workers in the NHS, who are working alongside a huge network of volunteers from communities around 
the country. Community, it would seem, doing the work of propping up capitalism and its rampant self-interest without re recognition or celebration from our government. Thinking about community now, it would seem, is ever more urgent. And so we are deeply grateful and deeply privileged to have two eminent speakers join us this evening to offer us their thoughts uh, to each other and then to us on what kinds of communities might be imaginable or possible in our times of crisis. So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ludmilla Jordanova, Emeritus Professor of History and Visual Culture at Durham University, and Professor Trish Greenhalgh, Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences at the Nuffield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences at the University of Oxford. Welcome Ludmilla, welcome Trish. Um, and I'm gonna hand over, I think in the first instance to Ludmilla. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for this invitation. I have to say it's one of the toughest assignments I've ever had. Um, and I do have a text, so forgive me if for, sometimes I'm, I'm not looking directly into my camera, but I think these questions around community are so intricate that I didn't trust myself not to have one. So here we go. Community. What a slippery, ever-changing and multivalent term and how to say anything meaningful about it in a short talk, especially since it infuses both every part of our lives and so much abstract discourse, the analysis of societies and politics, let alone media commentary, which could not do without it. Many of you will have read Stephen Reicher's article in Tuesday's Guardian called, Community Has Got Britain Through the Pandemic, How Can We Create More of It? Now, I agree with some, perhaps even most of what he says, but I've decided to stick to the path that I'd already chosen to tread. And I'd like to suggest that his take might be something we could come back to in discussion. So to make this capacious, emotionally dense concept manageable, I'm starting with community in the everyday during a pandemic. The situation has entailed paying conscious attention to ourselves, to physical and mental health, well-being, and coping strategies. And I take all these phenomena to be encompassed by the term medical, and hence to lie at the heart of medical humanities. I turn to experiences of the last year and to mine specifically, in order to root what I say in a particular every day, paying attention to the kinds and scales of community. So the most immediate one must be the community where we have been living in lockdowns. Now mine has been a small hamlet of 11 older people, none of whom is experiencing poverty, but at least one of whom is extremely vulnerable and two of whom probably had COVID early on before that is testing was widespread. So we pass each other outside, we pop into gardens, enjoy brief chats, drinks or eating outside well, when allowed, and share shopping as and when, sorry, as and when necessary. The environment is healthy. We have space inside and out. But I noticed that some have been doing distinctly more to help neighbors than others. And I find the reason for this hard to fathom. And one woman in particular has st stood out as exceptionally generous. So even in this brief vignette, I think there are some themes that, um, that stand out. Proximity tells you something, but not everything about small communities. Feelings and practices, even on a tiny scale, are markedly divergent. And in remote rural areas, people may be bound together more by practical considerations than anything. And these observations, observations suggest to me that maybe reciprocity is a key component of community. But let me cast the net a little wider. Last year, I organized for someone who lives in an adjacent village to cut down a hedge in his spare time for a, I thought, quite significant fee. The cooking apples were ripe and abundant, so I invited his family to come down too and pick some. He'd been recommended to me by my next door neighbor. However, just as he was packing up and I was making conversation, 
I mentioned that I was going to have my annual flu jab and anticipating something for COVID-19. I'm sure you can see where this is going. This provoked a response along the lines of, you absolutely mustn't do that. They make vaccines from abort aborted fetuses. My wife and I were extremely ill after a few flu jab. And in any case, the mortality among older people from COVID is very, very low. It's been exaggerated and so on and on. I was and remain very shaken by this. I was angry and regretful that I didn't challenge him more. Now, I think many of the complexities of community in a time of pandemic are actually encapsulated in this encounter. Since I understand, the way I understand it is that he violated my understanding of community, including reciprocity, which for me includes fair exchanges and sharing produce, but excludes the imposition of conspiracy theories. We experience our quotidian participation in communities of different types and sizes in vivid and intricately interwoven ways, but feelings easily shift and be, can be disrupted at any moment by experiences that deny the, the existence and value of community in some way, even without the actors necessarily being fully aware of doing so. So my nearly neighbor denied the efficacy and collective benefit of vaccination. Or, although I suspect in his mind, he was remedying my ignorance and doing me a service. His communities and mine may overlap at some point, but emphatically not at others. And since I have not felt able to tell the neighbor who recommended him about the experience, this encounter has also loosened my fellow feeling with her. There's a lot of comment at the moment about polarizations. For example, the politicization of mask wearing in the United States, which need to be probed at many analytical levels from the micro to the macro and everything in between. And such phenomena illustrate how communities are forming, breaking down, reforming processes that are accelerated and intensified during a pandemic. They also hint at the intellectual challenges we face in trying to explain them. And that's a task for the medical humanities. Now, as I think about communities on larger scales, the personal component starts to change its shape. I know about the work of a food bank in a town 11 miles away. I try and read local papers and I participate in local politics. In these forms of community, my agency is clearer by comparison with quote, neighborhood, since I didn't choose my neighbors. At the same time, I'm depending more on others for information and insights, for setting the terms in which I participate. And as a result, my sense of community is less personal and immediate. And the further away I go, and I do not just mean physical location, the more dependency is enhanced, but without a comparable augmentation of agency. That is to say, both information and the capacity to be an agent touch me less directly and community becomes abstract. By certain criteria, I am still part of communities, postcode, parish, council, constituency, and so on. But the types of fellow feeling and agency have altered. Now, I'm suggesting that this nexus, agency, distance, abstraction, feelings with respect to community, gets to the heart of tensions that have been everywhere in the pandemic. And these tensions exist in zones between individuals' grasp of their situations and actions, and the less palpable world of policies and laws, infection rates, institutional regulations, mortality figures, the effects and efficacy of vaccination, evidence on long COVID, and so on. And it's worth noting, I think, that the virus itself can easily become abstract and that community is not the same as group or aggregate. It is not statistical, but felt and embodied. 
Community then, whatever it is, is fragile. Human beings' capacity to grasp and feel connected with the multiple communities that exist for any one person at any given moment is easily undermined, becoming distant, intangible, alien, and abstract. Now, this argument is not undermined by heartwarming stories about streets coming together, mutual aid, or money raised by accounts affirming the presence of community spirit. And these are indeed very, very important. But I do think these must be seen in the context of innumerable instances where some kind of disconnect is present. And I wonder whether the latter suggests structural issues around community. So instances include recent football crowds in Glasgow where light touch policing was praised, but COVID cases are now being seen in officers on duty. While the club in question did not fully own its responsibilities until much later. Now, such examples tend to cast one or more individuals, in this case, Scotland's first minister, in the role of admonishing primary school teacher, while not really getting to grips with the many forms of community that were in play on that occasion, which of course included those underpinned by religion and class, as well as sport. In his weekly FT column as the undercover economist for March 6th, 7th, Tim Harford described receiving a perfectly polite email that caused him, and I quote, to smolder with rage. It came from a man in his early 70s who couldn't understand why he and his friends were not allowed to meet indoors for coffee, given that they had all been vaccinated. The rest of the column involved him setting out the arguments, including the capacity of his respondent to act as a vector and expressing his acute frustration about people feeling invulnerable. He also examined his own dramatic reaction. In this case, the claims of one community, that is to say everyone, trumped those of another, that is the letter writer and his friends. Now I think Halford is unusual in being explicit about the complexity and range of responses from highly emotional to coolly analytical. Clearly extraordinary forms of special pleading have occurred. They and they suggest to me profound disconnect, like the helicopter pilot who flew many miles and I believe did so more than once in order to collect a roast brief sandwich. And I think we find these same issues too in languages of heroism, which by their very nature individualize heroes on the front line, untethered from, for example, structural understanding of the health services, their administration and funding. And it's just this that allowed a wealthy member of the House of Lords to state recently that nurses were pay, paid well for what they do. So no felt affinity there. And of course, there are myriad complexities nestling here, embedded in social, cultural and linguistic practices. But I'd like to suggest to you that there are also amazing interdisciplinary opportunities for the medical humanities. Now, there are some standard reposts to the points I've just made. The first blames and stigmatizes individuals for being quote, wrong or disobedient. A second stresses the need for more education and training in numerical and digital literacy, for example. While a third might claim that poor governmental messaging, U-turns and inconsistencies created a series of dreadful scenarios, leaving people confused and frustrated. Now, I've got no doubt that more responsible behavior on the part of some, better public understanding and competence in Westminster would help. But these reposts, I'd like to suggest, miss something absolutely fundamental. Health is indeed about communities and communities of many different kinds all at once. 
If during a pandemic, people are not offered the chance to appreciate the complexities of communities, to see their centrality for health, to feel the impact of publics and collectivities on well-being, to grasp the form of agency they do and do not have, that is to participate fully in understanding the nature of community and communities, I think problems will ensue. Of course, there are no simple remedies here, but challenges and opportunities for people who know how to think rigorously and humanely about community, health and medicine, express their, idea, their insights clearly and share them widely. Now, perhaps government advice and especially nationally disseminated slogans are doing just this, but I think that advice has been strikingly abstract. On seeing a road sign commanding save lives, drivers need to register both intellectually and emotionally how this translates into specific actions and their capacity to affect communities. But people are well able to justify what they do in the face of rules that appear to clearly prescribe those actions. The same road sign says stay home but is only on display to those who have not. Forms of disconnect, I'd like to suggest, are inevitably present. And there's a final dimension of community to mention because it ties together many aspects of what I've been talking about. All communities are so by virtue of something shared. In many cases, they thereby become a body, as in governing body. One definition of body is aggregate of persons or things in a body altogether, body politic, state, society. Now I shall leave aside the phrase altogether since the irony of the we're all in it together mantra requires no further emphasis here, but two other themes are worth mentioning very briefly. First, body is a powerful metaphor for organic coherence. It suggests many phenomena working together, for instance, in a state of health. Body evokes integration. One major theme during the pandemic has been pleas for more coordinated, holistic approaches in medicine and in policy, permitting more effective analysis of the multiplicity of factors that shape the outcome of COVID and resilience in general. Such analysis would necessarily include community. Commentators have been rel relatively successful in getting the importance of integrative approaches across. And I think an enhanced understanding of community and its impact on health is central to this endeavor. Second, senses of community, no matter what kind of community is in question, are grounded in bodily experience and mediated by the senses. It is evident in the fleeting community formed by, an, by the audience for a live performance. That audience, for performers will say, is active. It's a relationship, however temporary, and that relationship is reciprocal. Now, it's no coincidence that workout cooking gardening, repairing, and making pottery have been such huge hits over the last year. And I think that's because they approximate that vibrant state of being part of an audience when embodied affinities are generated. In all these cases, it is possible to share something, even if the participation is only vicarious where our embodied experiences are enlivened by watching and hearing, imagining touch, sensing the mediating role of fellow human beings by communing with them. Experiences such as these may be short-lived, but I'd like to suggest they can also be life-saving. Using community in this context acknowledges its flexibility. Like many keywords, its malleability makes it both potent and slippery. Now, for me, the prime example is music. If I watch and I'm transported by a group of musicians 
performing. That is an embodied experience. I become part of their audience, as does anyone else who is present with me. Imagined communities are gener generated around actual communities of musicians, presenters, technicians. And if we have paid for the music, contributed to organizations and charities in order to sustain the arts, further communities arise and so on through petitions and pressure groups. And here we move from the embodied to the abstract, more or less seamlessly, revealing not just the complexities of communities and hence of the concept community, but their rootedness in the everyday, in bodies, fingers, hands, movement, senses, sharing. As someone who works a lot on the visual arts, I was unable to mobilize enthusiasm for watching a person talk about a static work. It was music that brought well-being and in a manner that was bound up with something shared through affinity with bodies in action an embryonic cluster from which community can grow. So in concluding, I just wanted to say that I have tried to speak in such a way as to suggest openings for medical humanities scholarship. These thoughts too are embryonic in sharing them during our temporary state as a community. I hope that something may grow. Thank you. Many thanks, Liv Miller. That's fantastically rich, and I've certainly made lots of notes, lot, prompt, lots of, prompted lots and lots of thoughts. Um, can I just remind you that you are perfectly, um, uh, you know, uh, welcome to put thoughts, uh, comments, questions in the chat as we go along, and we will come to them. Um, let me um, open up to Trish, um, and uh, and then I'll you know bring us back together but Trish over to you yes uh, thanks very much Joe. uh that I just want to congratulate Lou Miller on, on that amazing uh amazingly broad and deep coverage of community beginning with a little story of a tiny community with 11 people and think of community as kind of tied to place but also enduring relationships you've known each other for years and all that sort of rather traditional view of local community but then taking us right out into uh different uh, representations of community and time and space and through embodiment uh, and all that kind of thing now i i didn't write out a talk because i wanted to pick up on some of the things that Ludmilla said but also um i wanted to make this quite personal because I wanted to think well what community have I been involved with um Joe said right at the beginning beginning hang on a minute I wrote it down um where are we hyper individualized hyper competitive and to some extent that was true um what happened to me about a year ago was I was sort of thrown into a media role this was not my plan um, but somehow being trained in, in public health, uh, doing research at the front end of, of some of this uh, COVID stuff, being a medical doctor, but not actually practicing medicine. So as a medical academic, um, we were moving pretty fast to try and deal with the uncertainty. Uh, and I ended up spending a lot of time on television. Um, and that was a bit disorienting. And I started to think as I was preparing this talk, um, in what way was my experience of community tied to my own local community? In what way was it a virtual community? Because I'm, you know, I'm active on social media, but as I say, I was working in mainstream media. And I thought what I'd do is I'd hang uh, part of this talk uh, around a very personal um, experience which is the death of my own mother. And the reason I wanted to do that was, it was the first thing that came to me when I thought, when was I most connected? And the answer was, it's a, it's a really strange thing. Um, I put out on Twitter on the 28th of December, the day after my mother died, I put out this tweet, I'm gonna read it to you. It said, Good, goodbye, mum. You died of COVID-19 
days before you were due to be vaccinated, you told them to give the ventilator to someone else. I said a FaceTime farewell from a hospital car park. You will have a Zoom funeral. You are 2020. And then I said thanks to the devoted, exhausted NHS staff. Now, I, then, I thought I'd better tweet that my mother had passed away because I wasn't going to be at work and all that kind of thing. I didn't expect that tweet to get 11 million impressions. I didn't expect it to be picked up by Piers Morgan and subtweeted by him and feature on Good Morning Britain the next day. And I didn't expect it to be picked up by the Daily Mail, the Times and various other newspapers. Um, that was not why I put it. Um, I got a message from my brother saying, what on earth's going on? But the reason why I'm putting this out is that I have felt incredibly connected to the many, literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who replied. And the reason why they didn't know who I was is that we were connected and we were connected through our experience of not just death it was everyone was dying of the same disease that's not quite true but you know what i mean it was the abject um it was the way our loved ones had died we were not by their bedsides we went through i've just um had a paper accepted on moral uncertainty i was asked to write a paper on uncertainty at the time of covid and i decided to write it on moral uncertainty as to whether I should go in and visit my mother on her deathbed uh, when I uh, was uh, clinically vulnerable and not immunized or whether I should stay in the car park uh, and I wrote a paper about that but actually every relative uh, of someone who died and there's been uh, 1.25 million is it have, have died uh, sorry 125,000 have died in this country um, there's an awful lot of people who went through exactly that experience and it was confusing and it was frustrating and it was horrible, but it was shared. That's the point. It was shared uh, in a way that um, I don't think I've shared anything with quite so many people, but there was there were more things than that that we shared. Um, Ludmilla was talking about music and I knew I had to plan a Zoom funeral. I knew it wasn't going to be the same. Uh, the funeral, I mean, I've been to so many funerals um, before. You know, the family come together. Someone gives a rather kind of cheesy eulogy. And then you all go off and eat food, don't you? Um, and get together and catch up and say how the grandchildren have grown up and all that kind of thing. And we weren't going to have any of that. We were going to have a Zoom funeral. Um, which was going to be dry and awful and hardly anyone was going to be there. But actually, you know, weird things happened. And I think this is relevant. So my mother was a very religious person. She used to go to Germany and stay with a group of nuns in a German nunnery. Uh, and the nuns, of course, wrote uh, by email. I didn't know nuns had email, but apparently they do. Uh, and I was able to read out some of their messages at the funeral. But also they were watching. We zoomed my mother's funeral through to the nunnery and also of course through to people uh, all around the world um, and people from her local church. Uh, and if they couldn't connect by Zoom straight away, they could, they, you know, they could watch it for a month afterwards or something. I chose, um, we had some hymns that my mother chose, but I chose one, which was John Rutter's, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. And the reason why I chose that one is beautiful um, hymn, of course, uh, but also because it had been put together by the NHS choir uh, and they had sung it from their separate um, homes in that wonderful compilation um, in memory of the healthcare workers who had died. And so the, as the music came, and just as Ludmilla said, there was something extraordinarily powerful about playing that music and feeling close to my mother, close to the NHS workers who had uh, given the ultimate sacrifice, and that's a bit of a cliche, um, but the music expressed something because this was such a horrible thing to be happening to all of us. Um, there was a lot of solidarity there, but keeping with funerals for the minute, because 
this is the sort of thing you don't tend to talk about. It's normally pretty private. But here's another thing that was shared but not talked about. So my mother, my mother's funeral didn't happen for more than a month after she died because there was a queue. Um, the crematoriums were full. Um, and it was almost impossible to get through to the hospital. It took maybe one hour, two hours sometimes to get through to the hospital to talk to someone to say what's happened to my mother. Uh, and it took a long time to get through to the funeral director. And there was one situation. Um, the funeral directors all got COVID and we had to wait uh, for them to, to recover from COVID. So that was another thing that put it all back. But then they, they, said, they said to me, um, there's just been a little bit of a problem with your mother. Um, we're not quite sure where the body is. Um, and I thought, gosh, I've never talked about bodies before, not, especially not my own mother's. Um, so they said, you've got to phone this number because the, actually what's happening is the mortuaries uh, are full and we've got these temporary mortuaries. So I thought, all right, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this. So I had to phone up the, the place that you phone up in the hospital uh, to find out what had happened to my mother's body. And I phoned up and eventually got through to a woman um, and explained that the funeral director had said that, they, that they'd lost my mother's body. Uh, and then there was a, something that triggered the general practitioner in me. There was silence on the phone. And I said to this person on, on the phone, um, are you all right? And she burst into tears. And I said, look, I'm a GP. Um, I know my mother's died, but you know, let's just have a chat. And she said, my job is to telephone the relatives of people who've died and explain to them that we have moved their next, their body uh, into a temporary mortuary. And she said, um, I've, I've not long left school. Um, and I've been doing this all day. And I thought, my goodness, we're going through it, but so are you going through it. The funeral directors were going through it. The mortuary attendants were going through it. And yet this is something we're not talking about. And that's why I use the term, the abject. These are things we do not think about. We do not talk about. They are deeply, deeply private. Um, but actually, I wanted to raise them today because I had a chat with this young woman and I said, you're doing a fantastic job. You know, they clap for the nurses, they clap for the doctors, all that kind of thing. Nobody was clapping for the woman who had to phone up the relatives and say, uh, we've shifted you at your, your mum's body. Anyway, we found her, don't worry. And it was all fine. And we had a great funeral. Um, OK, let me talk about one other thing. I wanted to talk actually about masks. Ludmilla's already mentioned the politics of masks. Uh, it's a year since I published a paper in the British Medical Journal arguing for what we call the precautionary principle. Look, these things probably don't do any harm. They might do some good. Why don't we all wear them? It might prevent an awful lot of people dying. Well, that went down like a lead balloon. But gradually over the next few months, uh, the science perhaps became stronger. I thought it was pretty strong at the beginning, but. Um, it became a thing that was probably a good thing to do. And then in July, it became policy. Uh, and then some, but not all people thought, yeah, that's probably a good thing. And then masking in shops and perhaps in the street became an expected thing to do. Um, so what does the mask mean? So look, I've got one here. It's like Blue Peter. I've, here's one I, I prepared earlier. This is, you know, this one, this is the one that you get if you, if you forget your mask when you go to the hospital or something like that, uh, they just give you a sort of cheap throwaway mask. But it looks a little bit like a doctor's or a nurse's mask, doesn't it? But then it became this. Do you remember this kind of thing? That um, well, I've got another one here. Here's a nice bright pink one. These were the masks that we were going to wear um, as a, a bit of fashion, really, to um, present ourselves to the world you know, good old Goffman face work, if you like. I just thought of that. Um, we, were, we were the presentation of the self. Um, and what does it mean? Look, here, here's a homemade mask. What does a homemade mask mean? It means, well, you know, I got my act together. I was doing my duty. 
Um, it goes with the sourdough bread and the clay and all the things we were doing in lockdown. Um, and I remember being on a webinar, not, it must be nearly a year ago with Alison Pollock, um, uh, and me talking about what a great idea this was, make your own mask and here's a pattern. And she turned to me and she said, this is so middle class, Trish, this is so middle class. Um, you know, you can do it because you own your home and you've got a sewing machine and you've got the skills, all that kind of thing. And then the maskless, the people who didn't have, couldn't afford to pay the one quid to buy one or who, who couldn't, you know, who couldn't make the, the, the sort of fashionable one, was going to wear a plain black one, all that kind of thing. So then it became a kind of class thing. And then someone came up with the idea of mask trees. Let's have a community mask tree where the people with sewing machines and creative talents can make masks and go and hang them on a tree. And then people without such things can go and take a mask. How lovely, um, but also very middle class. Um, but let me show you another mask, actually. Look, I've got one on here. You can't even see that it's a mask, but look, this one, you thought it was just a scarf. Well, this is a very smart mask. This is a clever mask. Uh, it's actually called a face gaiter, and it's very thick. It's, uh, it's made of quilted material, and it's very scientific uh, because it's scientifically the most uh, efficient, effective, uh, mask that you can get. It's as effective as one of those N95 um, respirators. Um, and there's a company that make these uh, and they'd like us all to wear them because they are so super efficient. The problem with um, something that, that goes basically just below your eyes and around above your ears is um, that's what burglars wear, isn't it? Or pirates or um, you know, it, it, it's associated with someone doing something that, and, and being up to no good. And so you get the suspicion, whereas if I just sort of turn up in my flimsy little flowery one, which actually isn't very effective, it's better than nothing, um, that gives you more of a sense of community. And so I've actually got a, a student who's just starting a project to get children to design their own masks um, and tell us, why they think that the mask they have designed is one that uh, people their age uh, should should be wearing and, and their age would want to wear. And so masks become a kind of design challenge. So all that was interesting. Um, but to go back to American politics, what on earth was this about masks, face diapers, muzzles, all that kind of thing? And why was it linked to the religious right? I still can't work that one out, but there were pastors in American churches that would stand in the pulpit and tell people, you are pansies if you wear a mask. So this extraordinary word, pansy, um, we used to use it when we were kids to refer to male homosexuals. It was something not very manly or something like that, a ghastly term. Um, and so wearing a mask became linked to weakness, to female traits. And that is partly because they were linked to caring about other people. So the mask, even at the beginning, the mask that we wore in the shops didn't really say, I am protected. It said, you are protected, but it also said, we collectively are protected. It was a sign that we care about each other. Uh, we care about each other as a, as a community. And I, I think the slightly cheesy idea of the mask tree um, did rather symbolize that, although it didn't, it wasn't massively well received. Um, I wanted to say one more thing um, about masks and community before we open it up, because I'm sure you've got lots of comments and things. Um, I went on um, primetime TV about a month ago to talk about masks and jogging. Now, in the old days, when we had the old variant of COVID, really just a sort of folded over bit of old T-shirt was OK. That, that was actually gave you about 80 percent protection against spreading the virus to someone else if you had it. So you just get a drink. But then the new variant came in, the Kent variant, much, much more contagious. <coughs> and so the problem with that is 
that if someone's exhaling as they're jogging past you and you're inhaling, you could catch it. And there's not much doubt about that. And so suddenly the idea that you could catch it from a jogger, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm choking, meant that we had to suggest to joggers <coughs> that they needed to wear masks. And that really didn't go down well. I'm completely losing my voice. So I'm going to stop soon, but just one thing I wanted to say yeah. is that I got more abuse from that statement. Um, I had death threats, I had rape threats, um, I had um, criminal, you're a criminal, um, they challenged all sorts of things. What was it about suggesting masking of joggers that was so much worse than suggesting masking the rest of us? And I still don't know that, but the hostility associated with um, joggers, and I'm a jogger myself, so joggers who now jog without being masked uh, get a lot of abuse, but also people who suggest to joggers that they might mask when they're jogging past people um, also get abuse. And I think that's quite an interesting one. You know, the whole community thing really, got very toxic there um so i'm going to stop there because i've run out of um voice so if you can pitch the questions to someone else for two minutes joe <laughs> i'm going to mute my mic and cough all right you take that time trish that's absolutely fine um right what i what i might do is ask liv miller if you'd like to come back in on any of that i, I actually think that the way we've been approaching things has been remarkably uh, compatible um, because a lot of the situations that Trish has described are actually very fluid. And I think it's this coming in and out of that sense of fellow feeling. Um, I, Trish, I, I thought one of the things that was particularly interesting was your discussion with the young woman where you said to her i'm a gp but actually what you were offering her was what anybody you may be very skilled at it but anybody could have been humane enough to respond in that way <laughs> So I thought there were quite a lot of things nestled in there where you kind of went into professional mode. Um, and obviously, I, general practice, for those of us who work in, on medicine and the history of mm. medicine, general practice is a very particular kind of cluster of phenomena where we see issues around community particularly mm. clearly. Yeah, can I just respond? There? I don't. I don't think I was um, particularly being professional there. Quite the opposite, actually. I was a kind of um, slightly confused relative. But I suppose what a, it was a kind of shorthand to give her permission to share stuff. I think when I said I'm a GP, I suppose if I was, if it had been face to face, I might just have done it with body language. But but when you're over the phone, look, okay, I, you sound like you've got something to say. But yes, in in a way, it was. You're right, Ludmilla, that we, as health professionals, as, as other professionals, we were going through the same thing as that wonderful um, group of individuals known as the general public. And so sometimes we were the general public and sometimes we were professionals. And that, of course, is, is quite an interesting one. Anyway, let me hand back because you're still commenting. No, I was just wondering whether if you'd said, it's OK, I'm a mum. Um, and I suppose one of the things that we might be exploring in, in talking about community is where we give ourselves permission to act in a way that is overtly communitarian. And actually what I was suggesting was that in a Hamlet, it's not necessarily self-evident. So, you know, if there was a, an emergency, in a small community, I think people hang together. 
But actually, I do think those relationships can be quite fragile. I mean, one of the things I didn't say, um, but perhaps I can say now, is I'm very aware that my political views are completely different from those of the other people in the community. And one of the things that has struck me um, is that I think people find it very difficult to talk about the political dimensions of COVID. And I reread the two things that I referred to in my little talk just, just beforehand. And I was quite surprised on looking at them again, how little they make the connections between political issues and issues of community. Because for me, those are absolutely inseparable. And I thought Joe brought that out in, in, in her introduction. And I think that's very worrying. And we know that we're living in a time where in academic settings, there's, a, there's the potential for disapproval if we make comments or do work that is potentially seen as too political. So I suppose for me, I'd like to keep unfurling those sorts of things. And I did also want to um, offer a kind of encouragement to people who might be thinking that they that the medical humanities has something to offer and obviously it has tons of different things to offer but i do think it has something quite specific to offer about around that notion of community because it can work at lots of different uh levels so for me that's something i'm very interested in i hope that doesn't sound too airy fairy but in my head it's it's sounding quite clear <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, that one, of the, one of the things that was going through my mind when I was hearing you speak, Vimula, was that um, community is, it's an effortful accomplishment, even when there's only 11 of you in a hamlet, perhaps especially when there's only 11 of you in a hamlet. Um, I suppose it's, a, in, a, in a way, it's, a, we, one, one thing we haven't talked about today, because it's, it's, it's not the, the, the set topic, if you like, but it's, it's relevant, is actually we've, we and I've been living pretty close to the person we live with or the people we live with, um, rather than let's meet so-and-so down the pub for last orders. It really has just been me and them for, you know, the last year. Um, and so we've been thrown into our own relationships in a, in a sort of, in a way that we, we hadn't anticipated. And, and some relationships have, have strengthened and endured and some relationships haven't. Um, but the idea that the community aspect is really quite effortful now. Um, we, you know, we, we can wave to people in the street and everyone stand outside at 11 o'clock just to say hello, those kind of things. Um, we didn't have to do that before. Um, yeah. But doesn't that mean that we have to, even if uh, most of the time it's done semi-aware that we have to conceptualize our affinity with other people and think about the terms of the relationship yeah and i think that's what i was trying to get at yes. and i hope the anecdote about the man who cut the hedge wasn't too tedious but i i, I to me it's been one of the experiences of the last year that has most stood out and i i tell it in a sense against myself because yeah. actually I should have said to him, now look, hang on, you know, you're in my garden, I'm paying you to do a job. Don't you dare tell me that I am not at risk when I, you know, I yes. have been trying to inform myself about what the situation really is, but I didn't. Yes, it's, it's reminding me of, um... A book I've been reading, I can't remember the name of it, it's about political crises, or no, it's about crises, not necessarily political crises. Uh, and whoever wrote the book says that if crises are characterized by uncertainty, urgency, and threat. And it seems to me that one of the things that's happening with all of us and happened, you know, just over a year ago, we, we were in a crisis. There was uncertainty, there was urgency, and there was threat. And the problem with uncertainty is that we then grasp at solutions. And I guess 
Um, we haven't really talked about populism. I talked a little bit about American pastors, but of course populism is feeding people a very simplified version of reality and it's feeding them what um, the populists think they want to hear. Uh, and there was certainly an awful lot of populist science, populist policy around COVID-19. And yet it was incredibly serious. Many of us lost loved ones. Um, and I guess it brought, I mean, your hedge example, I, I just love a little bit actually. And it brought me to a, an example from my own family where one of my elderly relatives ha has a chiropodist who comes in uh, to do their feet. Uh, and the chiropodist has some very interesting views, uh, which I don't share about the science of COVID and what, what, whether some people should be vaccinated, but, but exactly the same. This person wasn't just cutting the hedge, they were in the living room doing whatever chiropodists do uh, to one of my loved ones. And actually I thought they should have kept their mouth shut. Um, but, but, but in fact, the, the, the common thread through both of those is that both of those individuals had taken on a version of this pandemic which didn't align with science and did align with populism and it came into our homes but i do wonder whether this connects with what i was saying about things being abstract because i do actually wonder what you you know how in the 19th century there was all this resistance to the germ theory of disease <laughs> And I did, a bit of me, I, a bit of me did wonder whether this was a bit like that. That, you know, we are told stuff, the stuff is removed. And then you're asking people to exercise these sometimes quite complex maneuvers in their lives around community or public or solidarity or whatever and maybe maybe there's a genuine problem there and I have even caught myself thinking you know I know people who've had COVID but no one close to me has died and you know you can sort of feel yourself I don't know if that's evocative at all you know I think it probably after is, yeah. a year I still sometimes forget to put my mask on isn't one of the things that that um, the intrusions into our lives were pretty unprecedented? Uh, I mean, I'm 62. I never remember schools closing. Um, I never remember. We, we haven't had lockdown in my lifetime. Um, the things we were asked to do um, because of the crisis were very personal. They affected every aspect of our lives you know we couldn't go to the pub we couldn't go to the cinema we couldn't all those things um and i guess people were looking people are looking for a, for a potted version of this really isn't as bad as people think um but yes to go back to the topic of of, of this evening's uh, discussion that pervaded and influenced and disrupted our sense of community of course while we were being asked to mobilize it at the same time. Absolutely. And, and it, was, it was unremitting. It wasn't like we could have a holiday from it and come back. Um, it, it's still going on. And, and actually, we don't know, you know, look at France. I mean, look at whichever country, Brazil. Um, we thought it would be a few months. And so, you know, maybe we should think about what's, what's happening to community as this becomes chronic. Joe, do you want to, because I noticed someone put in a comment uh, very early on about belonging, mm. which I thought was interesting, yeah. because I think, I think belonging has some of that same fragility to it that I was trying to draw attention to, because I think you can be in a group where you know you belong in some formal sense, but the discussion can go in a direction where you feel you don't belong. I mean, that would be a bit more like my feeling this political anxiety with the people 
around whom I live. And to be honest, because there are 11 people, there'd be no point in putting up um, a political poster. But I, I've asked myself, would I do that? Because would it lead to awkward conversations and so on? And I think that is a lot about belonging and not belonging. And I think it's a bit like when you use a microscope and things go in and out of focus. I th for me, that's a very evocative yeah. simile. Um, so your sense of community, your sense of belonging can move back and forth, up and down, side to side yeah. and so on. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, someone put something in the chat about clapping for carers. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about clapping for carers. Well, I'll do, no, do. It's one of the later comments, but I thought it is a good time to ask about that. Um, yes. What what are your thoughts on clap for carers? I was I hesitated. I was going to rant about clap for carers in my short little introduction and opted not to. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I, I found it very toe curling. I, I think the first one when we did it once and we all stood out there and everyone was in complete shock and, and you know, all these deaths were happening the very first Thursday night at eight o'clock, whatever it was. And then I, it did it all kind of wore a bit thin. But then what happened in wave two, instead of clapping, is that you got mobs of people outside hospitals yeah. and clapping for the carers as people went off their shift, as the nurses and the porters and the doctors went off their shift, they got abused by people who told them that they were making it up, that there weren't any people in there with COVID, all that kind of thing. And I think, you know, clapping for carers, yeah, I bet we many of us probably feel similar, but what on earth was all that of organized people gathering round hospitals at just the time people knocked off their shifts to, to hurl abuse at them? In a way, this isn't community. What's the opposite of community? There must be, Hannah Arendt must have had a word for it. Someone, someone help me there, but it, it, I think this is terrifying. Um, we someone asked in the chat if we clap for carers um, in the hamlet, and our front doors are quite a long way apart from each other. I mean, one of my neighbours owns, I think, fifty. And needless to say, not me, you know, little garden. But one of my neighbours owns fifty acres, so maybe more than fifty acres. So it wasn't really feasible. I felt very, very ambivalent about clapping for carers. I thought it was sort of tokenistic. Um, someone who I think is very good on this is Rachel Clark, the palliative care um, physician, uh, who was also on, I think it was an um, edition of Private Passions on Radio 3, where she talks, talks about some of these musical themes that I that I was raising, and about what it's like to have abuse hurled at you. So it's a kind of inverse of the clapping for carers. I'm very, um, I'm very unimpressed by gestures because I think um, there has been a culture actually for quite a few decades now where you perform yeah. being charitable or good or whatever and that that's sort of a job done. And I think that really is a dereliction of our duties as citizens. So our duties as citizens must involved, involve sustained commitment to certain kinds of shared values. Mm. And I just don't think clapping for carers is that. Do, do either, just in relation to the clap for carers, do either of you have thoughts around, and, and Ludmilla, you were, you were saying earlier about the sort of the, the worrying sort of disconnect, if you like, between, between the cultural and the political. And I wondered if either of you had thoughts about the mobilization of some performed idea of community that was really yes. was being mobilized politically by the government around this this sort of um this thursday night slot if i can yeah I've, i you've put words into my mouth or took words out of my mouth I, I i was trying to formulate that as an idea that it was it was too orchestrated wasn't it because i think sometimes spontaneous outpourings of collective emotion can become a worthwhile social drama, if you like. 
and I'm trying to think of one that worked. Um, Couldn't we talk about Nottingham and the women coming out for a completely peaceful vigil? Yes, a peaceful, absolutely peaceful vigils. Um, and I'm trying to think, something happened after one uh, young pop star, wasn't there a bomb in Manchester at a concert or something? Oh, the yes. Sunday concert. That's it. Yeah, sorry, I'm not, not very good on popular culture, but, but I think something quite touching happened after that, and I can't remember exactly what, but that was because people did it, not because someone on television told you to go out of your doors and do it. And but actually the, the clapping for carers, though, was started by an individual woman Okay. Who had seen it in Europe, seen that it happened in Europe. And oh, then it was right. yes, taken it, over by the government. Yes, um, it, it was the Italians in Lombardy that were doing it from their balconies, but they were singing and doing all sorts of clever things. I mean, we British didn't have the talent, so we just walked out and clapped. But uh, yes, you're right. You're right, it was. But but actually that's precisely what killed it. Was was it was it was then appropriated by the government and you know so look it's five to eight out you go and <laughs> it didn't have the same feeling of spontaneity or, or genuineness. But it isn't it partly a problem when something goes on for such a long period of time that people yeah. feel kinds of fatigue. Yeah. And I think we should be sympathetic to that because I think one of the things we haven't really unfurled yet is the kind of tiredness, the kind of exhaustion. Yes. that the last year has brought. And uh, certainly I find that being in touch with other people, which you could call a dimension of community, is one of the things that can stem that sense of fatigue. So perhaps the dynamic here is between um, your energy, as it were, dropping inside you and it being able to be remobilized in dynamic relationships with other people. And I, for me, that's very much about the music thing yeah. because the music is a manifestation of energy in the way that just looking at pictures or a virtual museum tour really isn't. So maybe, maybe we should be, I mean, yeah. you know, energy is a difficult concept, but maybe that captures something. That's fascinating. I want to hear more about your music, like which music? <laughs> oh, well, we'll talk about that another time because I think, we're, <laughs> I think well, we ought to hear what else is in the chat. Well, actually, music is in the chat, chat though, Lug Melissa. Oh. Um, Alex says um, that uh, especially struck that art performance music is figured here as, quote, your words, embryotic, em sorry, embryonic cluster from which community can grow. So I think there is a, an appetite to hear more. About, about that. Okay. It's not in fact, so yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's about the human voice a lot. Mm -hmm. And I notice that the instruments I like, like I'm very fond of the cello, are instruments that are much closer to the human voice. And um, I grew up in Oxford where there's a fantastic place where you can go and listen to chamber music. And even as a, I think, utterly obnoxious teenager, I would rush off and listen to inter intimate um, music. So for me, those are some, but I like big opera too, but I think the human voice um, is incredibly important to me. Um, I think I support quite a lot of musical organizations. I'm a trustee of a musical organization. I actually find it very difficult to articulate adequately because I think it's that powerful. Uh, one of the, the, the musical organization I'm a trustee of, which is called Mahogany Opera Group, has developed a way of bringing opera into primary schools by teaching children how to perform little mini 10 minute operas called snappy operas. And there is something incredibly powerful about, about seeing children having access to something like this often for the first time. Um, so, you know, it mobilizes very, very deep um, somethings. And I don't think it's just feelings. Um, I think it's, I, I don't, there must be people on the call who've read um, Vikram Seth's um, An Equal Music 
I think that's a book that really tries to grapple with, with some of these questions. Um, I, mean, I don't know if that... Yeah, can I tell you... The... Of course, Trish, absolutely. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about the Holy One music rooms, I think. I'm, I'm still in... I am. The yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the one I miss most in Oxford is the, um, the Bach soloists. Um, they had a project which is taking several years to perform every one of Bach's 146 cantatas um, at the right time of year, you know, and so they go through it and, and about once a month we would gather in the most beautiful chapel and, and the reason why I, I wanted to um, talk about that is that you get to know the singers, you get to know the performers, not, not intimately, but because you go back there and I've got a, a colleague, actually an ex-PhD student, who um, is an opera singer. And she, was, she sent me a list of the parts of her life that have changed now. Um, so, so, I mean, her day job is a doctor, but she, she's a very serious amateur op opera singer. And it was, it was the number of different performances four different groups so you know for people with disabilities in in care homes but also professional performances and we the the consumers of music if you like and i i'm not very musical myself but the consumers of music miss it but even more than that the performers uh, their lives have been completely turned upside down i'm just thinking of that lovely irish cellist who tweets he plays the cello outside his cottage in Ireland and you get, you know, like a little snippet on Twitter and he, that's the way he's, um, you know, dealt with the pandemic. But those who make music, that community of performers has been just shattered. Having said that, you know, th there's been some really creative ways of uh, bridging things. You know, the Met Opera have done amazingly um, you, you sort of get beamed into someone's living room where they're, where they're singing some aria. I mean, they, you know, they've done as well as they can be, but there is something about live music where we're all in the same room. And it's just such a tragedy that the virus is spread through singing. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I just wanted to say, someone asked us if, uh, about if we would acknowledge the impact on the arts and I, I think Trish and I are both very very happy to do that um, and I, I do think that in mobilizing a sense of community around performance that's perhaps something very valuable that we could do and I think that does mean dipping into our pockets I mean I think it's interesting because I think a lot of us probably share um, a commitment to a, a critique of some of the co forms of commoditization that seem to be ever growing. Um, but actually, I think to commodify music is completely ac acceptable and indeed is actually ethical, an ethical obligation if young musicians especially are going to survive. Um, mm. So that was really what I was thinking of when I was talking about music. So for example, also in Oxford, there's a thing called the Oxford Leader Festival, which is run by a really amazing man who really develops young performers. And um, I have a look at their website. I think they do the most wonderful stuff. They work in deep ways with schools. And I think if you decide to support something like that, you do become part of a community. And the, the guy who runs that organizes discussions. And he said something which may sound a bit banal, but um, they've done two online festivals in COVID. And he both times when he's been speaking, he said something that I found very, very moving, although it's very obvious. He said, what I miss is standing by the door and greeting people when they come to concerts. So the thought that, uh, you know, superb musician stands by the door to meet people, to me is a sort of mini encapsulation of a particular approach to music. Uh, and of course, there are many, many other forms of this. The only other thing I'd like to say is I think I would have gone bonkers 
in the first lockdown without the Metropolitan Opera in New York. So we watched an opera almost every single night. And you may think that's a bit bizarre. No, we did too. But did actually too. was an incredibly powerful ritual. We would often sit with our dinner on our knees, you know, and uh, I think in the first three months, you know, we watched, I don't know, five a week or something like that. And what it does to sustain you, I think, is is very, very real. And it is, it, it's not about individuals, I don't think. I think it is about communities and lots of different overlapping communities. Sorry, to, I, I'm aware. I, 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 I totally agree. And I, I, had, I had the same experience. And, you know, the Met put a lot of their, their stuff on for free. And there was, you know, there was one a night. And, and we were all very grateful. But I'm really conscious of this note in the chat. Um, where is it? About deprivation and minority communities. And I feel we need, although I totally agree about the music and the opera and all the rest of it, we need to acknowledge that there were two pandemics going on, weren't there? There was the pandemic that was about the sourdough bread and the opera and make your own mask and um, all that kind of thing. And then there was the pandemic that was about multi-generational households in tiny little flats where many family members had multiple risk factors and COVID went through those families and, and picked off multiple family members who spent a long time in hospital and people lost their jobs and or they were in the gig economy and they were just sort of waiting for work and it wasn't there. So they never really had um, what I would recognize as a job. Um, and yes, we ought to reflect and think about community in, um, in groups like that. And I suppose the, we've been doing a bit of work around, funnily enough, it's, it's called a community oximetry project. This is putting my medical hat on, but um, actually I think it is probably relevant to talk about um, that, you know, the oximeter that you put on your finger to tell you whether you've got an oxygen level that's low enough to call the ambulance sort of thing. Um, and this is a middle class thing as well. We've all got one from Amazon, haven't we? Uh, no. But actually, no, well, good for you. No, that's great. <laughs> uh, but a lot, a lot have actually. Then the GPs will say if, the, if you've got an educated patient, they already got an oximeter. How do we get the oximeters out to um, the harder to reach communities? Uh, and we're working through, actually, we're working through uh, faith groups and um, particularly mosques. And of course, normally, normally pre-pandemic, um, many, not all, but many ethnic minorities would be living a lot of their lives through their faith. And they would be, you know, around the temple or the mosque or the synagogue or whatever. Um, and of course they're all closed. And so what we're finding is, yes, we can go and talk to the imams and we can say, can we please work with you with this community oximetry project? But they would say, well, yes, but we're doing our services by Zoom as well. And people can phone in, but the connection that we, the faith organization have with our communities has also fractured because of the contagiousness. Uh, and people are looking forward to the mosques opening quite soon. Apparently it's gonna open a bit for Ramadan um, but I think the whole business of faith bringing the community together uh, is something that maybe we should think of a bit more. You're responding to the comment in the chat about polarised and hidden aspects of communities, Trish? Uh, a little bit, yes, I think I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that strikes me as a very, um, a very important question. And I have mentioned food banks in passing. Um, I live not too far from a place called Galashiels, where there's yes. quite a lot of deprivation. Yes. Um, and the food bank has been a very important focus, I think. Um, now, whether this does reach groups who could be described as, as hidden, I think it's very hard to say. Um, and I noticed that there's not a lot about that in the local papers. Um, so, I mean, I think this is so important, but I, I'm, it's not, when something's hidden, I suppose by definition, it's not always easy to know 
not just how to find it, but how to talk about it. And that's why I think keeping on having the conceptual conversations as well as the practical conversations and keeping them in play together is so important. It's not a very adequate response. Um, I suppose... We had the, on. one of the things we were talking about uh, earlier today when we were talking about the, the Oximetry project and how we were going to get through um, to communities that we're not part of actually is, is part of it. Uh, we would previously have worked through particular community organizations, particular community contacts, uh, and many of those are not happening in the same way. Citizens advice, for example, um, bilingual health advocates, community navigators, many of them are doing it on the phone. Um, and yes, the food bank is an interesting one. We are going to be giving away oximeters in, at food banks um, because actually people do physically go to food banks. But is that a community? It's probably just where you get your food. I wondered if there was something to be said about, sorry to jump in, um, but I was just thinking about, you know, the relation between communities in terms of, um, uh, you know, power, I guess, that, um, you know, the, 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 the certainly Lud Miller, when you were talking about the sort of the inside and the outside and the fragility of community, of course, part of this is about power, isn't it? And sort of, you know, kind of a, a dominant communities and how other communities, uh, you know, further to Jennifer's point, really, uh, might be hidden, but also might have, you know, um, completely understandable hesitancies around participating in something like a vaccination program when the history that's held yeah. within that community is, is of oppression. Um, mm. uh, and so I wonder if there's something to be said there about, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the friction, I guess, between different ideas of community. Maybe. I think there's everything to be said, because you could say that that lies at the heart of politics. So can I just uh, duck in and say, what about then um, the idea of social contract? Because that seems to be something that we lost, you know, the notion that we have an overarching implicit and perhaps sometimes explicit social contract but yes. say, this is what we owe to each other. Yes. And these are the reasonable concessions that we'll make in order to get on with each other. Now, you know, under the current administration, where apparently we ought to be motivated yeah. just by greed, clearly that's just about the opposite of a social contract, isn't it? Uh, one of the, an early question was about what are the ways we can encourage each other as a global community to put in the effort of, uh, well, looking out for each other, and how do we begin to bridge the gap between the political, current political orthodoxy of almost obsessive individualism and the now apparent need for a renewal of a social contract? I think that's an extraordinarily complex question. Um, part, and I actually uh, am a... Uh, the social contract thing actually makes me a bit anxious. Mm -hmm. So as I understand it, um, social contract comes into political thought in the 18th century with people like Rousseau. But I think what they're talking about is utterly different from what people mean when they talk about it now. And I wonder if it's doing some quite slippery work in public discourse, because so far as I know, it's, there's no shared understanding of what, what it actually consists of. It's a bit like the, the question of the English constitution. Yes. So I, I wonder if we shouldn't be a little bit suspicious of this and try to create other ways of talking about mutual obligation. But I have to say, one of my reactions, Zoe, is to say that people ought to go out and vote join political parties and get themselves organized. I mean, in Scotland, the participation rate in elections is generally below 50%. I mean, there's no hope if, I think, if people aren't engaged. And I, I do think the answer to that is services 
and opportunities and resources for people, let's say under 25, because this is something that you learn as you grow up. Yeah. And people resist compulsory voting although there are plenty of countries that do have compulsory voting. But I think unless people can organize it, it I mean, maybe I'm showing that I grew up in the 60s and, you know, I have a kind of rather old fashioned view of these things, so uh, forgive I, me. I grew up in the 60s too. And I think you're just describing what I meant by contractualism in the philosophical sense, rather than the social contract in the, you know, enlightenment um, uh, sense. But there, there are obligations that we have as citizens towards each other, not towards government, towards each other. I would want to bring in one other thing. I, I, I agree with you up to a point, um, but I think there's been something else going on in this pandemic. On the one hand, because this was so horrible, it was such a terrible crisis. Um, it's the nearest thing most of us have been through to a war. You know, it was it was, it was that ghastly. I think there was a groundswell of community spirit and reciprocity, but we couldn't enact that because of the concerns about contagion. Particularly the, actually one thing we haven't talked about is what I call infection control theater. You know, when you have to stand on the little, little circle when you're in the post office and that kind of thing, you mustn't be two meters within two meters of someone else you know all those things they're, they're not really evidence-based because it's all in the air um but there were all these things you know you have to wash your hands and, and and all that and it makes it jolly difficult to do things like help the old lady put her shopping in her bag when you're in tesco's um because you've got to stand back because of the infection control and likewise you can't pop round to see if someone's all right. You can't even knock on their door because people are frightened. Um, and I think it's it is partly the government. You know, we are in a in in a very toxic political situation. But that was compounded by some of the material um, aspects of the pandemic. And and I think it was the combination of both that made it just so ghastly for everyone. There's a comment in the chat I'd like to respond to about duties and rights, mm. if I may, Joe. Okay. Yeah, of course. Because obviously I think that's very important. And I would come at this through talking about taxation, which is the least sexy topic ever invented. But when I was teaching early modern history, one of the things I like to say to the students is, if you understand how taxation works, you understand something about all the other facets of a society, and that has not ceased to be the case. And isn't taxation actually the most fundamental form of community? Because we give, we give money, okay, money is taken. <laughs> money is taken for some notion of collective good. And I'd like to see a public debate which moves away from taxation as a dreadful burden and we all complain about it to taxation is the enactment of our sense of collective responsibility. So I think it needs, uh, it needs a PR campaign because the fact is if, pe and I think this does connect with what I was trying to say, if people can understand and affirm that when they pay their taxes, they are helping their child's primary school to function you get all those levels together and we don't really hear about that but all the time we are enacting collective responsibilities and duties and that's one of the foundations of it so taxation and the medical humanities how's about that for a theme <laughs> uh, can i just add one word can we call it progressive taxation and the medical humanities because uh, you know, if we look through history, I don't have to tell you this, Lemur, there's been some pretty appalling uh, forms of taxation that are regressive and, and are nothing to do with community. But but I get what you're talking about. It's, it sounds, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how popular it would be. <laughs> I mean, VAT would be a good example, which is not a, a, a not necessarily a good form of taxation. But this is why I think people should do things like reading the FT, 
which I think is making some of the most radical and sensible suggestions about governments and international finance, you know, and maybe people sort of distance themselves from that because they assume it's, a, it's always establishment. But, you know, they are promoting the work of people like Anne Case, for example, the North American economist who's been writing about deaths of despair, um, very concerned about the unemployment, alcoholism, drug dependency. So I, in fact, I cut out a bit of my talk um, that said maybe economists are some of the people we should be making common cause with. And I said, I, I thought, I, I think Anne Case is a really interesting example of someone who's quite inspirational and incredibly clear thinking about hugely complex economic phenomena. Because I guess that's one word that we haven't used is this is, is neoliberalism, uh, you know, as a context for this pandemic, but also for where ideas of community have, have broken down and indeed not just, you know, have been undermined fundamentally mm -hmm. by our economic structures. Yes, I'm sort of interested in your uh, and would support your idea that taxation um, and money and all of those things that look so unattractive are really interesting. Uh, just thinking about um, uh, human rights work, uh, we no one was able to get any kind of restoration of human rights for trans people by making a human rights argument and going to the European Court of Human Rights. It was one by going to the European Court of Justice, which deals with economic matters, and arguing on the basis of employment mm. and the right to work and the right to pay taxes. And that was far more powerful than any moral argument. I'm mm. sorry to say that, but that, that was the case. Oh, it's really interesting. Yeah. And in fact, all of the rights for, L, for lesbian and gay people uh, that have flowered since that case in 1996 all depended on the same arguments that we constructed back in 1996, which we constructed deliberately so that it could be applied to any other uh, excluded community on the basis of their um, economic usefulness. So emancipatory economics is what you're drawing attention to, Zoe. <laughs> well, I wish it was, I mean, emancipatory, it can be used in an emancipatory way. I don't think it has an emancipatory intent. I remember in the 1980s, you know, um, one of the, in, under Thatcherism, one of the reasons that so many unusual courses flourished, like, you know, film studies and cultural studies and women's studies, was because if students would join, if people would pay for it, then really the government at the time, at the time I was at the Department of Education and Science, uh, government at the time didn't really care what the subject was. If they were paying customers for it, then it was okay to do. And at, at that point I thought, gosh, this is very interesting. Follow the money, eh? Uh, that seems to be what the neoliberal mind uh, likes and understands. So in a way we're back to, you know, render unto Caesar and Caesar won't notice anything else. So it's a kind of a subversive economic theory, I guess. I have um, one eye on the clock because we're past nine and I did promise we would stop promptly. We've asked a lot from both Chris and with Miller. Um, so I think we probably should come to a close even though there is so much more to say. And obviously we've just also designed a new field, Ludmilla as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to need more conversation. Um, but I think I think we probably should should stop it slight. And I um, would, would like to, and as I say every time, very hard to thank our speakers properly online uh, with sort of silent, silent clapping. But I think um, I, I think if we are uh, and some emojis, I think um, some <laughs> clapping emojis. Thank you both so much. Um, incredibly thought provoking, incredibly rich. Um, and I'm sure our, our thinking uh, uh, about some of your really important observations will continue beyond this evening's seminar. So thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. And can we be reassured that you're going to save the chat? 
because there have been so many interesting comments. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yep. And will you edit a tiny bit before it's put online? Or is it put online? It's, edit, exactly? no, it's, it's, it's edited. A little okay. bit. Stay safe all. We will um, we'll be uh, advertising our, our next seminar in, in due course. And as Jennifer uh, said, please do go to the website. There's a ton of stuff to, um, to look at there. And also please do check out the details for Limerick in, uh, the, 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 uh, in June. Stay safe, stay safe, everyone, and see you soon.